Today, as you all know, the person who will be speaking, who in fact at the moment we are in our literature module, being taught by Samina Rahman and Neelam Hussain. Um, and we have Neelam Hussain who will be speaking on Othello, a post-colonial text, which has probably frightened a lot of non-literature people. But um, um, we, we should have called it racism or something like that. And, you know, um, but uh, because I think the way Needham is going to be looking at the text uh, would fall into the, into areas that would have been in our interest to uh, a lot of us. Neelam is the coordinator of the Singh Women's Resources Publication Center. She taught uh, literature at Kinnair College. How many of you are here from Kinnair? Okay, two very old ones. But I, uh, I called Kinnair, we called Kinnair College yesterday and they said we will all be there. So obviously Kinnair has forgotten Neelam Hussain. Um, she is deeply involved with uh, education at many levels and also engaged with the primary educational development on women's rights, uh, human rights for school texts. She has co-edited uh, Endangering the Nation State and she has to her credit several other publications um, on the whole, on a range of issues, um, some of which have been published and some not. Uh, and she's also been an active member of Women's Action Forum. Um, so I will now call upon Lila Hussain. Thank you, Bali, and uh, thank you, friends, for being here. It's nice to see so many friendly faces. It's also a bit scary to see so many friendly faces <laughs> because they will know how to catch me out when I'm fudging things and put me on the mat. Uh, actually, this is the first time I've taught the English course for women's studies here and it's been enormously enjoyable. I was dragged into it, bullied by Bunny, but with uh, between Meena and myself and Uma helping, it's been great fun. Uh, the decision to take up Othello for today's lecture has many reasons behind it. One was a lazy one, I'm teaching Othello at, in an A-level course at grammar school, so it's a text I'm engaged with currently, but uh, largely also because I feel that it's a very contemporary text, especially in today's context. Uh, in our discussions over the past two or three days when we've been talking of different texts and how we address them, uh, one thing has been coming up again and again, and uh, but I'll refer to a comment made by Samina Rahman that uh, given our historical and geographical location as a post-colonial culture, it is not possible for us to look at literature, especially European or English literature, without engaging with European imperialism. Uh, shaped, manipulated, and to a significant degree complicit as we are with 19th century Orientalism, we have been the products of Western imagination in the ways in which we have been presented or misrepresented or represented and in ways in which that we have begun to see ourselves also. Uh, now, Said has argued that this orientalization, uh, this discursive representation of the East has not happened simply as an act of, of imaginative necessity, but uh, as an articulation of, really, of a relationship of power of dominance of varying degrees of complex hegemony and in which precisely because it is a relationship of power, our position is, is rather complex. We are defined by the Orientalist discourse in a particular way, but we are also complicit in it. And uh, the other aspect of this, uh, these definitions is that uh, it is not possible to enter into this improvisational dialogue, uh, enterprise where you begin to define somebody else by understanding or empathizing with them to then manipulate them without somewhere 
being manipulated or directed oneself. So, although it is a power relationship and a relationship of dominance and control, it is not only the dominated who get defined, it is also those who dominate who are somewhere then defining themselves against that which they define as the other. And this is going to be crucial to my reading of, uh, uh, of Othello. I mean, in this uh, power relationship, to continue with that a bit, our position is not too different from, and this is again a reference from Said's Orientalism, from Flaubert's Egyptian courtesan, who never spoke for herself, never represented her emotions, presence or history, but allowed him to speak for and represent her to become in time a widely influential model of the Oriental woman. Uh, this does link, somewhere link up with Uthello and us through the dynamics of the Uthello Desdemona relationship, but also the rhetoric of the post 11 September, uh, the, the, the rhetoric that has come into being activated or reactivated or breathed a new, new life into post 11 September uh, has divided the world yet again into two. The one, on the one hand, we have the civilized West of Bush's speeches, on the other, the barbaric East, but unfortunately for East this time, read Muslim, the Muslim world. And, and this re, re, new re, uh, representation has come as a sharp reminder of the fact that we are still part of the same imperial venture, although part of a new chapter which is still in the process of being written. Uh, and it is, as I said earlier, for this reason that I have chosen Othello as a subject for my talk, for this too deals with the improvisation of identity. Uh, and the, an improvisation that is predicated on issues of power as it comes into play along the multiple axes of racial, sexual and cultural difference in the play itself. Uh, in this reading I hope to highlight how in Othello, and I quote here from Anya Lumba's book on Renaissance drama, how common sense ideas of blacks are evoked, questioned and disclosed as misrepresentation. But crucially, this disclosure is interwoven with the disturbance to patriarchal authority and to the illusory nature of absolute power. And that is where the whole tragedy of Othello is located, comes into play and somewhere inevitably builds up into a tragedy which seems was unavoidable given the terms of, uh, of its happening. Uh, just to briefly recap the story of Othello for those who read it long ago or have not read it, Othello is about a black, a black in Venetian society who has by merit achieved the position of a general in the army and has become indispensable to the security and the needs of the white Venetian state. He is, in that sense, an honorary white, a position very similar to so many of our immigrants, South Asian and other uh, third world immigrants settled in, in Europe or England or America. He has acquired the language of the adopted country, the culture of the adopted country, the religion of the adopted country, and is also watching the interests of the adopted country. Remember, it is against the Turks that Othello is protected, the state of, of Venice. Uh, he further gets integrated in, in, in that society through his marriage because not only is he a black who has risen to a position of immense power in white society, he ends up marrying one of the prettiest girls in Venice from among the ruling classes, which, and this is Desdemona. And he wins Desdemona over, who falls in love with him and he with her, through telling her stories of his adventures. The interest, the contact between the two is established through the stories that Othello tells, tells Desdemona. And, uh, and this is an interesting point because the just as he wins Desdemona through stories, he too is inscribed as part of another narrative which is being written in the story by Othello and by the other white relations with whom he is in interaction. Uh, 
So what happens is that Othello and Desdemona get married. There is a great furor. Othello's, uh, Desdemona's father is horrified, takes the case to the Senate, which happens to be meeting at night because suddenly they've had news that the Turkish fleet is approaching Cyprus. Now, this is how state interests overcome and subsume other interests in a society. Normally, the Senate would have been one with Brabantio, who is Desdemona's father, in condemning the marriage and perhaps punishing Othello. But because they need Othello to do the fighting for them, they justify the marriage and accept it. So here we have contending interests in the state, those of so the family, signified by the patriarchal power of Brabantio, who claims absolute authority over his daughter, that is the basis of his uh, attack on Othello, and on the other side, the equally absolute power of the state, which can decide or a matter of law according to need or vested interest. The other characters in the play are Iago, who is in the army with uh, Othello, he is his subordinate. He is known as the Ancient. I don't know what post exactly it signifies. Maybe uncle will tell us who the Ancient is in the army. <laughs> but uh, but, but uh, Iago is a disgruntled man and an angry man because Iago has been bypassed in promotion. Othello has appointed a young man called Cassio as his second in command or his right hand man or whatever and Ayago is very biffed. Now, so here we have a straightforward case of jealousy and resentment and anger against Cassio and against Othello and Othello's, uh, Ayago's anger is reinforced, made much more complex because Othello is also black. So it is Othello the black outsider who has become the insider and is in a position of superiority over Ayago, who is his cultural or social superior because of the color of his skin, but because, but by status is subordinate to him. So here is an area of dissension and discord and possible trouble. Then we have Cassio, who, who is a gentleman, basically. I mean, the same class as Desdemona, he's a nice man, but not as shrewd or as canny as Ayago is. Ayago, when gets the feeling, is pushing his way upwards, Cassio already seems to have arrived there in a rather untroubled way, so there are again areas of discord. Then the other character is Rodrigo, a man who claims to be in love with Desdemona and is very peeved when Desdemona runs off with this black man. And it's interesting that it is very difficult to separate uh, Othello's blackness from him. He is resented because he is the other man, but he's also resented because he's the other man who is also black. And the blackness plays a very major role. In fact, if you look at the play, if I haven't lost my notes, uh, I, uh, I think the first hundred and something lines consist of abuse of the white man of the black man by the whites. The play opens on a scene where the news of Othello's elopement has, is being given to Rodrigo, the rejected lover, by Ayago. And Rodrigo can't believe it. And then there is shock, horror, grievance that how could she choose that color over me? And the language is crude, it is sexually explicit, and uh, very familiar somewhere. Very familiar if we look at the kind of language that comes into play when our own, in our own, uh, in Pakistan or perhaps in other areas of South Asia, when the man suspects his wife or daughter or whoever of disobedience or of any form of action which is seen as betrayal. Uh, anyway, as I said, just to complete the story, I argue with Othello and Desdemona get married. They leave for Cyprus, where. Uh, Othello has to go for his military duties and uh, taking with them Iago and Cassio and Red Rodriguez and the other two women in the play are Amelia who is Iago's wife and Bianca who is a prostitute. And these are the three women 
who represent a spectrum of or a range of uh, feminine positions or positions of femininity within the play. I mean, there are variations in degree, but if when we look at it closely, there's not too much difference between, between them in terms of status or power. Anyway, Ayago begins to plot and plan, and he sows the seed of doubt in Othello's mind that Desdemona is having an affair with uh, Cassio. And Othello, who could have sworn uh, with his life on Desdemona's love, somewhere begins to crumble. And once again, issues of color, issues of gender relations, issues of power come in. Othello is black. He can't believe his luck that he's married the prettiest girl in town, a girl who was being chased by every young man about the place, every eligible bachelor. He has won her over with his stories. When, and this brings us to a crucial point also in the play when he wins the case against Brabantio. Brabantio said, well, I wash my hands off the whole affair, but look to it more. She has betrayed me once. She may betray me too. And it is almost a perfect prophetic statement and builds up inexorably to the climax because that is precisely what does happen. Not that Desdemona betrays her husband, but that he begins to suspect betrayal, predicating his insecurity on his color, his age, he's older than Des Desdemona, and the fact that she is his wife. And as Ayago sows the seed, the wife who as a daughter eloped with her a lover while in secrecy from her and her father had to clue as to what she was about. So again what is activated is the image of the deceitful woman. Uh, in all this Iago keeps on plotting and planning and finally Othello is driven to a point in desperation and rage where he kills Desdemona on suspicion. And again, we have come back in Pakistan with our honor killings, with our newspapers, which are full of news items. Brother kills sister on suspicion, father kills daughter on suspicion, husband, son, etc., etc. And yet, Desdemona is virtuous in uh, the mainstream sense of the word. Now, what is happening in the play? I'll just look at different points. Uh, there is Desdemona's character. Desdemona is one of Shakespeare's sexually, I think, most bold heroines. She is very open about her love for Othello. She is not coy about it, but there seems to be a disjunction. When Brabantio in court speaks of his daughter, he says she was so modest that no one could even hear her voice. And how could she have gone off with this black? this man with thick lips, this ugly, horrible man, he must have cast a spell on her. So again, another discourse is activated of the Easterner, the black, as barbaric, yes, uncivilized, yes, but also coming from an, a non-Christian, heathen, irrational, murky background in terms of religion. Black magic, arts, poison, potions, what has he been up to? And uh, when Desdemona comes in, you feel that the father obviously doesn't know his daughter because there is nothing shy or modest about her. She's a very confident young woman. She says, yes, I love Othello. And uh, this is why I love him. And when the court agrees to, to the marriage, accepts the marriage, <coughs> there is talk of his going to Cyprus. It is uh, Othello's going to Cyprus. It is Desdemona who says, I want to go with him. And uh, when they say, well, why can't you hang around here until he gets back? She said, well, I didn't get married to him to hang around here. I married him to get to hang around with him. Sexual explicitness, which you don't find in, I don't think in any of Shakespeare's heroines that I've come across, but I haven't read all of, come across all of them, so I wouldn't know. But, and this is, I think, where Desdemona's potential for of threat or danger lies. She is a threat not only to her father, whom she has left, she is a potential threat to her husband, which he then invents her uh, or thinks of her according to that. She's also a threat to patriarchal power, the power of the patriarch. So a woman who has been 
who has stated her rights. Now legally, Desdemona is within her rights in claiming to love, to marry the man she loves. But culturally, socially, otherwise, if it had not been for the, the state needing of Hello, perhaps the marriage would not have been condoned. Uh, so this is one area which makes her death inevitable. The other fact is that after her initial boldness in eloping with Othello and pleading for her case in court, she later falls back within the framework that she has challenged, that of being a good wife, an obedient wife who does not challenge her husband's authority. And perhaps it is this obedience which is also somewhere responsible for her death because she does not speak out. She does not question. She is not angered by... Uh, she accepts Othello's mistreatment of her when he begins to suspect her. So she is killed without Othello getting a chance to find out that he may be wrong. On the other hand, one feels that maybe if she, even if she did tell him, would Othello have believed her? Uh, so because Othello, Desdemona again is a white woman. Othello as a black can't believe his luck that she's married him. In Losing Desdemona, Othello does not only lose all that he is, has achieved, he also, you know, all the, the security of the love, his, you know, the inner security, he also stands to lose out on, uh, on uh, the status and the integration into, into white society. So in, in this sense, there is a very complex set of relationships, or three-way relationships in, in Othello. There is the black man, there's the white woman and there's the state. And along with the state, the other category would be the father. Somewhere the state and the family come under one, one uh, in one section. Uh, insofar as the language of the text is concerned, and we have been talking of how Othello is improvised by Iago, who plays upon his fears, who understands him enough, has enough of the of an imaginative understanding of him as the alien other to understand him and then to manipulate him. Now, Stephen Greenblatt has argued that uh, this em ability to empathize or to subversively manip manipulate the truth of the other is a European characteristic, a characteristic of what he calls or what uh, uh, Professor Lerner has called uh, mobile societies as opposed to static societies. And uh, Greenblatt links it with 16th century European expansionism, where the need to understand and subvert the other, to control the other, to manipulate the other for their own interests was part of uh, European necessity at that time. Uh, Greenblatt then therefore sees Iago as a prototype of the later European, the later Orientalist who was to emerge in, uh, during the time of the colonies as a, as a manipulator, as a puller of strings. In this, uh, at this juncture, Iago pulls the strings as far as Othello is concerned and he pulls them very cleverly. It doesn't seem very clever to us reading the play because it's rather obvious and in fact, during the play, Othello keeps on, Iago keeps on telling the audience, now I'm going to do this, now I'm going to do that. But, and that too is something which makes the play interesting. But obviously it works. And from sowing the seed of doubt to building it up to dropping a handkerchief in the wrong place, a handkerchief which Othello had given Desdemona, which then lands up in Cassio's apartment, which then Othello sees in Cassio's hands, is a building up to to, to the murder. Uh, so there is this improvisation going on. Uh, also in the terms of this improvisation, behind his back, Iago always calls him thick lips. To his face, he's very obsequious or very correct. Uh, the other thing that we see happening is the way language is used to manipulate the stereotypes about black or eastern or black people basically. 
The blacks are lecherous, the blacks are overlustful, the blacks are deceitful, the blacks are irrational, the blacks are barbaric. And because all blacks are all this and Othello is a black, therefore Othello is also all these things. And as I said initially, quoting Anya, that it is common sense notions of black of blackness which come into play, which are used to manipulate, to control and to build up to the tragedy. So, and again, and I don't think I'm sort of exaggerating here because uh, to quote Fano, uh, he has argued that colonial discourse erases differentiation between its various subjects and treats all outsiders as, as black and in identifying or, or locating its racism there is need to point out that it refers to political color rather than to the precise shade of non-whiteness. So there is an erasure of difference. We see it happening in the text when there is reference to Othello's religion. It is not Islam, it is not voodoo, maybe it is voodoo, maybe, but it's all flattened out. The differences are flattened out. The blacks, the east, the other is represented as an, a monolith and therefore reduced and somewhere simplified and uh, in Working now, I said that the, the dominant discourse manipulates the other, but also somewhere falls into that same trap itself. And somewhere it isn't Iago manipulating all the way. The material out of which he draws his manipulative discourse is, uh, is are things that he believes in. He cannot genuinely believe that Desdemona can fall for someone as ugly, who thinks, uh, he thinks is as ugly as Othello. Therefore, she has to get bored with him. So, there's a debasement going on. He says, well, once the initial lust is over, she'll get bored with him, she'll look around, and Cassio is good-looking, young, at hand. It's inevitable. So, in a way, he's inventing stories as it goes along. And what makes it particularly interesting is that we see a weave of stories being woven in front, us, in front of our eyes on stage. Usually, this kind of activity takes place behind the scenes in a private relationship between the writer and the text. But here it's happening in front of us. Othello wins Desdemona over with the stories of his adventures. Iago creates, narrativizes Othello and manipulates him. Desdemona is caught up in the narratives of her own femininity. The good woman, the deceitful woman, who is she? And in, in her own narrative of the obedient, loving wife, and she does love. Othello and loves him innocently, in the sense that he can't see what's going on around her. And then there is Amelia, Iago's wife, Desdemona's maid and friend, and she enacts her role as a good wife and cannot see beyond the surface of, of Iago, whom everybody respects, who is known by all as a decent guy. Iago is clever that way. And even at the end when finally the verb turns and she turns against Iago and says he's done it all and he's responsible, she prefixes her anger with an apology which says even though I'm a woman I am compelled to speak even if it is against my husband don't accuse me of disobedience. So somewhere it is the laws of the relationship, the laws of marriage, the laws of patriarchal relationships which are coming into play there. And then on the other end of the spectrum there is Bianca, who is Cassio's girlfriend, who is a prostitute, who loves Cassio, whom Cassio spends a lot of time with. And yet Cassio would never dream of marrying. In fact, when Iago at one point says, what about Bianca? Uh, Cassio proceeds to give a very graphic description of Bianca using gestures and uh, whatever to, you know, in the kind of language we use, which is commonly used when talking about, and we've been doing prostitutes and courtesans all of yesterday and today, uh, of, uh, of women who are outside the pale of legitimate uh, relationships. But when, at the end of the day, who has the power and who hasn't? Who is manipulating, who isn't? So, in this there is, Again, to recap, there is the three-way triangle, then there is the constructing of the other, Othello as a Moor, and then there is 
the conversion of the outsider into the service of the dominant culture, and this is a crucial feature of European encounters with other people. It is happening again today. You appropriate, you use, you reject, you redefine as you go along. And that is what happens to, uh, to Othello. I think in the, earlier I said this the word play, well, I don't know if I didn't say, the play is a, shows the progress of Othello from honorary white to rank outsider. And as the play develops, as the play builds up, and Othello's behavior also changes accordingly as his insecurities grow. The honors that have been heaped upon him in the first act, when he has, is the general whom the state needs, but by later the state needs less because the Turks have got, been driven back, not by Othello, but by a storm. But anyway, the threat is no longer there. The other discourse begins to emerge very strongly. And somewhere the honorary white is subsumed and lost gradually, increasingly, in the stereotype of the black, lecherous, barbaric, lustful, savage, irrational beast of a man. So somewhere then we see that the story which Iago began to invent in scene one act one, taking a concrete shape towards the end, pointing again to the power of words, the power of language, and I think we today are very aware with the kind of, with the electronic media and the, what mediatic representation <coughs> does, in the way how fictions can take on the garb of truth and mold reality. The, and the same happens with Des, Desdemona, who, moving from a position of rebellion, and somewhere it reminds me of uh, uh, Heer in Punjabi literature, and this is Najam Hussain's criticism, a critique of it, that Heer is the one who breaks the boundaries, who breaks the class boundaries, who breaks the boundaries of decision making and claims decision making and choice and claims her love for Raja. Later, by the time the family has ostensibly accepted it, it is Ranja who goes back, Ranja who has left his home and come out and become a yogi and uh, given up the establishment, then decides to go back to give a conventional resolution to the story. And that is when the system takes over and he is killed. So somewhere Desdemona's act here is reminiscent of, of Ranja that having taken control of her own agency in having claimed Iago, uh, Othello, she then backtracks and falls back into the conventional position of a good wife, takes on the conventional role, the conventional attitudes, and perhaps that is where her, the seeds of her destruction lie. Because as the play builds up, you feel that there's nothing that can stop this. Othello's madness, Desdemona's uncomprehending grief, I think, uh, when she can't understand the change in Othello, especially when he slaps her at one point, or even when he comes to kill her. And the, the dramatic tension in the play, the, you know, its emotional charge comes in the conflict in Othello himself, where he cannot not kill that which he loves so much. And again, it says something perhaps about the demands of absolute power, what Othello had demands, what Brabantio has demanded, is absolute control over the woman. And absolute control in the sense that any initiative, any act which claims agency is seen as a threat. And when that happens, that power becomes an impossible power. It cannot happen. It is just not possible, whether it is claimed by states or whether by individuals or by institutions. So the fear is inevitable because absolute power is always already underpinned, founded on fear. It cannot happen otherwise. And Othello making an impossible demand of his wife brings his own fears into play and kills her. And so Desdemona doesn't understand because Desdemona lacks that understanding which Iago has to understand the other's truth and use it subversively or even to her own ends. She, she, she doesn't know what's hit her literally or what's choked the life out of her. And uh, 
So it's it's interesting the play of uh, discourses that comes up in this uh, in Othello, the different readings it uh, lays itself open to. Uh, as I said earlier, it uh, is a play that is made up of a weave of stories. Iago shapes and controls Othello and his dest destiny. Desdemonia, Amelia, and Bianca are shaped by the stereotypes that constitute different uh, kinds of femininity. Rodrigo and Cassio are manipulated by Iago. Rodrigo because he's the not so bright uh, young man who thinks he's the great lover and ends up handing over all his money to Iago. And Cassio because basically he's a decent guy and he can't imagine that Iago could be uh, doing what he's doing. Uh, as I stated earlier, the art of representation or misrepresentation is part of the dynamics of our relations, and it is. Uh, but it is there is a mutuality in it. Those who initiate these discourses, shape others, are also somewhere being shaped by them, and this is where Iago see, sows the seeds of his own destruction, because he cannot envisage failure. He is so sure of himself, he's so sure that he's got everybody's measure, and really, you never ever can. Uh, that he doesn't know when, that Amelia will finally turn on him and accuse him and betray him. That Othello will take out his knife and kill him. That Rodrigo will leave a letter condemning him. He has been so secure in his own superiority, in his own in his own power, which he thinks is absolute, that he has failed to see what could have been so obvious to someone uh, less less imprisoned in his own uh, in his own sense of power, and so he too works his own destruction. Uh, Shakespeare's plays generally, <coughs> and again, this is. Obviously, not a point that I thought up for myself, uh, but I can't remember the critic who said it. Says that that in most of his plays, Shakespeare does address issues of power and the impossibility of absolute power, normally associated with kingship and monarchy. And inevitably, his plays deal with the collapse of a particular system or the other, whether it is Hamlet or whether it is Lear, whether it is through usurpation and uh, whim, the uh, whimsical exercise of power, or the kind of whimsical exercise of power that Lear indulges in through his abdication. You, there is, has a balance has to be maintained, but once power becomes absolute and feels it can get away with just about anything, it builds up to its own destruction. And here in this, we see this coming into play, come, happening, not quite in that sense, but through the institutions of the family and through, again, the institutions of uh, the state, which is a white state as opposed to a black man. So a different kind of dynamic is at work. And uh, I think that is what made so made Othello interesting for me. I don't know whether my students enjoyed it, but uh, I'm talking of uh, my MPS students, but uh, I definitely enjoyed discovering the play and uh, I think boring them to death with it. I think I'll stop now, not because uh, I can't go on and on, but I think I've gone on long enough.